Good evening from London and welcome to the Private Funds Industry Live Series. My name is Colin Leopold. I'm the Head of Research and Insight at Private Equity Wire and I'm joined by two speakers for the next 30 minutes to demystify private capital funds. If you have any questions, please drop them in the LinkedIn comment box and we'll try and get to them in the final five minutes. I'm just going to do a couple of intros. Lindsay, maybe do you want to start? Sure. My name is Lindsay Trapp. I'm a partner in Deckard LLP based in Charlotte, North Carolina, but I'm also an Irish qualified lawyer. So um, I carry a book on both sides of the pond and very happy to uh, speak with you all today. Perfect. Thank you. Liam, do you want to give a quick intro? Uh, thanks, Colin and Lindsay. Hi, I'm Liam McHugh, Managing Director of Fund Administration in Europe for CSC. Perfect. So um, maybe we'll start off just with an easy one. Um, just to get a grip on, I guess, some of the drivers that are pushing forward private markets. Maybe, uh, Liam, if we could start with you, what do you see that's really driving this continued development in private market funds at the moment? Um, yeah, it, it's very interesting. I think the momentum is continuing this year that we would have seen last year. Private credit, private debt are probably driving things forward. We're also seeing... Um, real estate and infrastructure funds popping up quite consistently now depending on the jurisdictions vc vc quite a lot out of our asian offices um and then in europe we're probably seeing a mixed bag of, of, of everything we're probably also seeing a funds irrespective of class with more of an esg focus as well popping up okay perfect lindsay are you seeing the same from your side yes definitely um i think Credit has certainly increased even more. Um, there's certainly still a lot of large buyout funds, but as we're coming into this uh, next market cycle, there's certainly been an increased interest in things like distressed credit, um, other opportunities to get in you know, to real estate and infrastructure. Those types of things have certainly been driving a lot of the growth that we're seeing. Okay, interesting. Um, Liam, I guess you both mentioned private credit, but maybe we could touch on that for a minute. Are there any specific things you think at the moment, I guess, macro and otherwise, that are pushing investors into private credit or increasing interest? Um, well, I guess I suppose we're, we're moving away from a low interest rate environment across the globe. So, yeah. you know, that's, you know, the, the low interest rates are having an impact. We're probably going to see with a bit of market turbulence, um, you know, that will drive things further in this space. Um, you know, I, I guess we're seeing managers, you know, that are come, you know, they've they're either growing existing funds if they're liquid, or if they're liquid, they're launching, you know, second and third funds in the space with, with greater expertise in raising further capital. Um, and we're probably also seeing in uh, even on the hedge side or, or other assets that aren't performing as well. There's probably a greater attraction to this asset class as well. Okay. Okay. And in terms of opportunities and roadblocks, do you see some asset classes fitting in the former and some in the latter? Where's the big opportunity at the moment? Um, I, so I, I think I think uh, private credit, private debt, I still think they're the big opportunities. Um, and it really, it depends by jurisdiction as well. But I think if, if we look at the States, and probably Lindsay's better place to look at that, but our, certain our US teams, um, they're really the, the the asset classes that are popping up. In in Europe, um, there still is a lot happening on the use it side, on you know, on the liquid side. But on the alternative side, in Ireland, we've got the the Irish Limited Partnership uh, fund structure was enacted last year. We're starting to see the momentum post COVID now coming up, which is great. Um, so you know, I think we'd we'd expect in Ireland in particular to see a lot more momentum with the ILP next year. Um, Luxembourg continues to be real estate, um, real estate, private equity, private debt as well. And then, you know, like I said, in Asia, it's a lot of VC, but certainly private credit as well is a big thing there also. Yeah, Thank you. Um, Lindsay, maybe from a US perspective, but also you touched on real estate. Maybe you could give us a snapshot of how things are moving there in terms of fund formation and opportunities. Yeah, I mean, in, in the US, you know, we are seeing a large drive in private credit. Um, certainly, there's a lot of benefit to coming into a long dated fund right now in, in a high interest rate environment. Um, you've got a lot of folks that are looking for non traditional lending um, as we also come into an economic downturn. So it's a good you know opportunity to put capital to work for a long time. 
um, also private credit is a really important strategy for things like pension funds and insurers where they need to have a steady income stream over a long term. So that's a lot easier achieved in, in credit-based strategies than it is in equity-based strategies. Real estate, certainly we've seen, you know, some increase. I've actually seen a bigger increase on the real estate debt side than traditional real estate. But I do think that as we come into sort of what's happening now, which is a bit of a, a market downturn in real estate in certain places in the U.S., um, we'll certainly probably start to see more buying up, um, you know, people trying to renovate properties, that type of thing, and, and grow those with funds over time. Okay, interesting. And are you seeing much distinction between what's happening in the US versus Europe in terms of that focus on private credit? Um, obviously, there are regulatory concerns with private credit that are upcoming in Europe, which I think we'll discuss a little bit later. So I tend to see more private credit coming out of the US than I do out of the EU. But um, certainly, it's, it's a popular strategy um, all over. <clears throat> and I think that as the European markets are getting more comfortable with non-bank lending. It's certainly continuing to rise. Okay, that's, that's a great point. Um, Liam, did you want to come back on that? I guess we're still on the topic of fund strategies, even within private credit and private debt. There are speciality strategies and bespoke strategies. Lindsay mentioned real estate debt, for example. Are you seeing evolution there? And maybe how is that informing the structure of the funds? Uh, yeah, I suppose it's, it, it can be a broad category. We're probably seeing a lot in uh, you know, loan origination uh, on the distress side as well. But, uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, it, it can be a broad asset class. But, uh, you know, I, I think um, certainly more so in the States, but we are seeing it here in Europe as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And any advice to our audience or people listening in in terms of the structuring of those funds and within private credit, for example? Oh, yeah. Well, Lindsay, do you want to take it first? Sure. I mean, it, it obviously depends on who you're selling to, right? So private credit, particularly in the US, um, is very much focused around the tax structures for this. Um, credit is something that can generate effectively connected income for non-US investors. So you need to structure around that. Um, there's kind of four basic structures that we've typically used in private funds. So you've got season and sell, um, entity-based treaty, bring your own treaty, and then leverage blockers. Um, all of those continue to see a, a lot of airtime. Um, I think season and sell, season and sell still remains the most common. But you know, if you're doing a really large global fundraise, um, entity-based treaty also is is quite popular. Um, for smaller kind of new entrants into the space, we'll tend to see more leverage blockers. One of the things that's been an ever increasing rise, and we're starting to see a lot more kind of mixing between the private um, fund side and then in the re registered funds or retail funds in the US is the BDC, the business development company, which is a registered fund, but it's permitted to invest in long dated assets. So particularly direct lending. Um, that's sort of the holy grail of entities uh, for a lot of people because it's treated as a RIC for tax purposes. So it washes clean UBTI and ECI um, for US tax exempt ERISA plans and then for, for non-US investors. So to the, to the extent that you can actually integrate a BDC into the structure, it can be very useful um, from, from that perspective. There are obviously limitations with that. BDCs can't be passported within the European Union. They're also can't, they can't serve as a master fund to a European aid because if you do that, you lose the passport. So there are different structures that can go around that. Um, but we're certainly seeing a lot in that kind of focus space of figuring out ways to, to deal with the tax concerns on direct lending. Um, ultimately, in Europe, of course, you've, you've got um, generally structures like the ILP um, that is, have come out in, in Ireland. And then obviously the continued success of the SCSP um, in, in Luxembourg, the RAFE. Um, so I think that those tend to be more traditional structures, but I think that we will see over the next little while with changes that are coming up in LTIF 2, a bigger rise in LTIF, which is a essentially the European version of a BDC or, or the hope that was, um, 
else if one wasn't particularly practical didn't really take off um, but now with the new changes that are upcoming to the LTIF we're certainly seeing an extremely large increase in interest in that product um, it provides you with a lot of opportunities to have a passport without having to deal with the direct AIFMD regulation or being a usage you can still sell to um, you know essentially high net worths and and to an extent retail investors so I think that we will continue to see growth on that side as well in those types of structures. But overall, um, I'm still kept mainly busy with uh, traditional sort of closed end uh, partnership structures that may have many bells and whistles to deal with with tax structures. Um, but uh, that's that's still the kind of go to for for most folks. Perfect. Thank you. Great answer, Lindsay. Thank you. Um, Liam, can I come back to you on that? Maybe uh, the evolution of the LTIF being a, a specifically interesting point, I guess, that Lindsay raised. Yeah, and I suppose that's that's really a work in progress. I think the the other point I'd probably be looking at this from a European or from a European perspective and from an investor perspective is quite interesting as well. We've seen a lot of parallel pop funds popping up where it's a US manager and they're launching a European structure um, either more often than not to, to house the European investors um but I'll, or you know alternatively to to house the assets in Europe in some cases you, you know you, you can see those assets um in Europe sit within a an SPV potentially and are under Luxembourg alternatively but the parallel funds have been popping up a lot this year as well okay okay anything else on your watch list in terms of fund structures to look out for um well in in Europe I, I guess the ILP is, you know, sitting yeah. sitting in Dublin. The ILP is one that we're we're hoping to see good growth. You know, we, we feel it's a structure that we we've seen the success that the SCSP has had in the last seven or eight years. You know, facilitating U.S. managers coming to Europe. Um, you know, the the Irish equivalent. You know, the the industry here feels that it would be a good alternative. Um, so it, you know, so we we wait to see the momentum with the ILP um but Luxembourg continues to you know to, to boom the SESP the RAVES you know, our, our teams in Luxembourg are really busy with those structures um looking beyond Europe to to Asia the in, in Singapore the VCC structure has been extremely successful okay. um you know it's been incredibly well supported by the uh the regulator and the government there with significant grants for um for setup costs and origination costs um you know I I think there's well in excess of a, a thousand BCCs have been registered at this point in, in the last two or three years, which yeah. just shows how how uh, strong the growth has been there. Typically, the structures that you know, like, like a lot of VCCs could be hedge or uh, illiquid, but we're definitely seeing a lot of uh, VC funds popping up here. Yeah. Um, the Hong Kong Limited Partnership uh, is, hasn't gone away. There's and the, the regulators put a bit more focus on supporting that as well. Um, once again, Cayman, you know, we, we see, we're seeing a lot more Cayman um, this year, you know, and Cayman, I guess, can house, house any any uh, asset class or, or strategies. Um, yeah, but I guess that's typically what we're seeing across the board at the moment. Definitely, definitely. Great answer. Can, is there a point there to be made about hybrid funds, I guess, especially with hedge funds developing a more kind of illiquid offering? Yeah, we're, we're starting to see it. Not, not a huge amount, but, you know, we're seeing, you know, we're having conversations with people and it's, you know, you know, they, they mentioned the asset class they're coming into, which typically you would expect would be a closed end structure. Um, but, you know, it's what they're thinking of really seems to be evolving more into this hybrid structure, you know, and it's, it's interesting, um, you know, because, you know, it, it, it raises the question of the ability to, um, to, to, uh, for the investors to, to take money out of the fund and the mechanisms to facilitate that um, and even the valuation of the funds themselves when they're hybrid depending on the strategies um you know the, the valuations can be that little bit trickier as well but we're, we're certainly seeing some of those at the moment definitely definitely did, lindsay did you want to comment on that hybrid fund structure point yeah i mean i i see a lot of this in my line of work um, managers coming to us hoping that uh, we can you know kind of work in this space i think that hybrid funds are a very large range, right? So you've got everything from kind of what I would tend to call more evergreen structures all the way through to kind of really just hedge funds with a little bit more liquidity parameters around them. Um, 
it all is sort of a an ongoing desire to drive permanent capital and sort of avoid having to go out and fundraise every couple of years. Um, that isn't always going to be possible. And I would say that, you know, we certainly have a number of funds that we've been doing where they're evergreen in nature, which basically means that investors come in um, and then they have sort of a continual reinvestment period. And then they decide when they want to get out, when they want to get out, their assets are put into sort of a segregated type of class, and then they're just run off in the natural course. Um, truly sort of hybrid structures you end up in a lot of considerations around liquidity management, and it's extraordinarily important to deal with that. We've been seeing a lot of uh, kind of funds that have been structured this way. So, for instance, like open ended real estate funds and that type of thing that have been going on for a while. But of course, when markets change or if there's been great success and then there's a large number of redemptions, you run into a lot of considerations that perhaps investors gloss over or managers don't really think too much about at the time when they're getting into the fund, um, you know, but you have to have money to pay those out. And so then your liquidity parameters become very important. So even if it says that there may be redemptions, you know, quarterly or yearly, um, it very well could be that those have to be significantly gated or you perhaps go into a no withdrawal period um, because of the fact that there's just not cash to actually pay out the, the redemptions. So um, while they certainly are on the rise and a lot of people can do them quite successfully, it really is something that I think managers need to very seriously consider their liquidity uh, management policies, their liquidity parameters. If it's a fund of funds type of investment, how do the underlying funds um, pay out? How do you deal with any kind of mismatch that might occur? Um, it's It's something that isn't to kind of just go into without significant sort of, um, you know, in-depth look and time um, thinking about that. And honestly, a lot of people that start looking into them um, will eventually kind of just say, do you know what, we're just going to do it as a traditional closed end fund um, because it's, it's just not something that they want to get into. Then we see kind of more in Europe, we'll see something where they aren't necessarily going for that evergreen type structure, but they will take advantage of the umbrella fund structure so they can just sort of replicate on the same platform. That's obviously a helpful thing with the, the cost of setting up um, in Europe and the number of service providers you have to have. In the US, we have series structures. We just don't tend to use them very often. Um, and that's mainly just because the cost and the time to do in the US is significantly less um, than it is in, in most European countries. So. Okay, thank you. That's a great point on liquidity management, especially at the at the moment, um, in terms of redemptions and the volatile markets, right? Um, yes. Leah, maybe I can come to you on that point in terms of gated funds, open ended funds. Do you think that's something we should be watching for in the future in terms of how fund structure is evolving? It, it shouldn't be, but it will be. Yeah. Um, you know, I think going back ten years or two thousand eight, two thousand nine, you know that you know the K clauses became a, a significant challenge in a lot of funds. Um, and but it's certainly popping up again and interestingly enough flicking through one of the the sunday papers here at the weekend it, it was front page in one of the business papers of the uh the gate yeah. clause and one of the large managers which was quite interesting um but understandably you know it is going to be a key factor liquidity management is key for investors um it's key for the managers as well um you know so i think it's greater focus is going to be played on this um but at, at the same time you know these from the outset any well stru structured documents for any for any fund should be very clear on you know the redemption clause and the gates that are there so the investors if you know if they're institutional or even if you know if they've read the prospectus they should have you know some clarity yeah. on what's going on also yeah for sure for sure um lindsay gave an answer to this earlier actually but we've got a question from the audience on that point on liquidity management just in terms of the type of tools that can be employed by gps are we seeing a range there on offer or is it still quite tricky, I guess, to, to deploy? Um, I would say in general, it depends on how illiquid your strategy yeah. is, right? So there's obviously a big range in portfolios. Sometimes you're talking something like 80% is going to be, you know, in loans or real estate that you can't just sort of sell off and get rid of. Sometimes it's a very small portion. So 
there is a bit of a range in what people use. There's a lot of um, lockup periods. So there might be, you know, a two or three year period in which there can be no redemptions that could be rolling. Um, so if, you know, it's investor by investor, um, it could be fund wide as well, sort of depends on how you, you can deal with that liquidity. Um, certainly provisions around gating, um, you know, that can be fund level gates, investor level gates, um, which, you know, investor level gates can be really helpful to a manager. Um, in certain circumstances, fund level gates can be in others. Um, so, you know, we, we tend to see a range kind of around in there. We're seeing probably an increase in the more illiquid side. Um, we're seeing increased periods of lockup periods and then also things around redemption gates where it may be something that just says, you know, we will gate you down to zero um, if there's a period in which we can't. The other thing that we see a lot of is the ability to have what we call slow pay classes. Um, so essentially sort of like I was talking about in Evergreen, on the day that they want to redeem, there's a snapshot taken of the portfolio that's then sort of hived off. So they just don't participate in the redeeming investor doesn't participate in new assets going forward. And then those other assets roll off as they can. Um, some funds attempt to do liquidity matching. So if there's subscriptions coming in, um, they can match those to redemptions, but they'll always have some sort of parameter that if there isn't an ability to match at that point, um, you know, they'll, they'll be able to put you into slow pay on the rest of those things. Um, there's a lot of considerations that go around all of those. Uh, slow pay classes have a lot of issues with ERISA that people need to really get into and consider um, how to manage ERISA, um, you know, and 25% tests. So lots of different things that, that people are using, um, but, you know, there's, there's no one size fits all, I think is probably the key because every fund that's a hybrid fund is so unique and different. Yeah, yeah, great answer. Um, Leah, maybe I can come back to you and taking a step back a bit. Obviously, both of your answers have leaned heavily into regulation and how regulations coming down the track are steering a lot of fund formation and fund strategies. Is there anything we should be looking out for in the year ahead or years ahead in terms of how regulation is going to shape the fund structures we're seeing? Uh, yeah, well, I, I think that's a given. And, and I'm just thinking back on uh, Lindsay mentioned uh, an open-ended re real estate fund structures and we, we had conversations with with one here in Europe over the summer months and it was it, it, it sounded fascinating just the mechanism behind it but you know on top of that the other thought that came to us immediately was how the the regulators would deal with this and the, the liquidity mismatch um so I'm, I'm not sure what would happen there and if, if that fund will proceed and um, when it comes to the regulatory landscape we've afmd2 come in we have uh, the SEC in the States looking at private funds and starting to, you know, to introduce some of the, um, the the regulations that traditionally we would have seen on the uh, on the mutual fund side being applied to the private funds, which is placing additional burdens on managers, which, you know, in, in theory should you know, create opportunities for service providers like ourselves. Um, there's been an ongoing discussion in, in recent years with the MAS in Singapore that fund administrators are going to be regulated there, which would raise the bar but it's just you know i, I think the regulator in in, in asia or well, in most jurisdictions have been focusing on on fund regulations but you know bringing regulations in the administrators is also a, an interesting um area to look at as well but i i think the the most interesting area really here is probably the states with the sec looking at the, yeah. the private fund managers yeah definitely well, one area we haven't really got into too much is ESG. And we actually had a question from the audience earlier talking about interest in ESG funds specifically. Obviously, in Europe, we have SFDR. Um, I wondered if you wanted to maybe touch on that for a bit and just talk about sustainable uh, regulations and how that's driving things. Yes, in Europe, we absolutely are. Yeah, yeah. absolutely in Europe. Um, and it's coming from both angles. It's, it's funds with traditional uh, asset classes focuses, but with an ESG angle to it now. And we've, you know, we've also uh, got clients that are just purely ESG focused. Um, you know, so absolutely in Europe, in the States, it's it's occurring more and more. And in Asia, it's, it is occurring, but probably not as much as we'd see in America, which is probably less so than in Europe. Okay. Okay. Lindsay, are there any specific challenges around setting up ESG funds, maybe separate to other asset classes or sub asset classes? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it obviously depends on where you are. Um, in the US, we don't see as big of a driver for it in private funds. There's more of a 
kind of mutual fund space, um, I think in relation to ESG, where we do see it some is when somebody's looking to also raise in Europe um, and, you know, facing into something like SFDR, certain, um, you know, institutions in Europe that people might be looking to raise from are going to require um, certain levels of ESG compliance. We also have to deal with SFDR in any fund that's set up over there. Um, so we've certainly seen some of it uh, from here. I think that when you're considering ESG, you know, there's there's a lot of different angles from which you have to look at it. And you have to really consider some of the regulatory, let's say, mismatches between different jurisdictions. In the U.S., you know, registered investment advisors need to seek essentially the best returns for their their um, investors. And so you have to really think about how you're disclosing to people how ESG fits into your process. Are you essentially forsaking returns that you could have gotten for a focus on ESG, which is very similar to what, you know, they've attempted to do in, in Europe with the SFDR. I think that um, over time, the ESG landscape in the U.S. certainly will evolve. There's a lot of, uh, let's say, different and conflicting political positions on that that I think will make it a far less fast growth than it has been in Europe. Um, in Europe, of course, when you're structuring, there are substantial amount of things that you need to consider if you're looking, you know, Article 6 funds relatively straightforward. You start going into Article 8 or even Article 9. Um, there's a lot of disclosure points that you have to deal with, reporting points, um, you know, making sure that you are properly fitting within the marketing of that, um, you know, strategy within Europe. But I do think that as kind of people evolve, markets evolve, there's a focus generically on, on getting more into ESG or at least taking it into account in investing. Um, whether or not it's the real focus of the fund or not, I am seeing an increase in managers in the U.S. Um, you know, tend to at least say that it factors in at least at some point within their, you know, asset um, analysis. So, it's, it's something to be watched over time, I think, but I, I do think that there will continue to be quite a big disparity in relation to regulation on that point um, between the two sides of. For sure. The point around uh, reporting requirements is a good one. And I guess it brings us into one of our final questions, which is just around um, operational complexities and just in terms of the running of funds, especially when you have diversified asset classes in play. Liam, maybe do you want to touch on that quickly? Yeah. Look, as, as a fund services provider, it's, it's a space that we're seeing more and more opportunities in. Um, if you you factor in the, the growing regulatory burden, you look at the landscape we've had, um, you know, post-COVID where managers are like no different than any other uh, uh, con company or, or industries that, you know, they're struggling to retain staff. So, you, you know, it's presented opportunities for us. Um, and I think we'd expect that, you know, that trend to continue. Perfect. And Lindsay, maybe you can see that question in front of us on uh, domiciles. Do you want to take that? Might be a final question, actually. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Um, so, yes, Ireland and Luxembourg are the traditional most favorable um, domiciles for an entity level treaty structure. So that's very key to understand that it's not kind of bring your own treaty, which is where each investor has their own double taxation treaty. Um, for entity level structures, the one caveat that I would say between Ireland and Luxembourg is that the Irish treaty is more favorable. Um, it's certainly easier to deal with. There are certain restrictions in the Luxembourg treaty around what constitutes a good U.S. person um, for that purpose. And so it can actually limit the banks from which you can receive leverage or subscription lines. Um, so we tend to see more structured with the Irish treaty than we do with Lux, but both work. Okay, perfect. And um, we were going to talk a little bit about new investor segments, which I guess we've touched on a lot through the whole conversation. Um, did you want to just maybe finalize on that in terms of talking about private wealth, retail investors, how they might inform some of your answers so far? Sure. From, from my side, certainly, you know, the overall focus on permanent capital, larger pools of capital and growth um, certainly, you know, has has factored into a lot of things over the past many years. I'm a private funds practitioner, but I do interplay a lot with our mutual funds team. So there's obviously, as I've spoken about, a huge growth in BDCs and sort of a crossover there. Um, but there's also longstanding structures within the U.S. mutual funds market, including interval funds and um, closed end 
funds, registered funds, um, that have been allowing investors, retail investors, access to more liquid strategies for, for quite a while now. And I think that we're tending to see a lot more of that growth and, and people kind of looking that at that as these more liquid structures come into an overall desire um, by managers to bring these asset classes more to the masses, let's say. Um, in Europe, we're certainly also seeing, you know, continued use of the, the part two um, in Luxembourg. And then in Ireland, um, we do have a, a, our own RAFE, um, the retail investor RAFE, slightly different acronym. Um, but also the QAFE can be uh, privately placed within different jurisdictions around Europe. So, you know, semi-professional investors in Germany, um, similar to the qualifying investor criteria, Luxembourg has a similar criteria to that. Um, the Dutch market will allow you to register. So it's it's a number of things that you can do to, to be able to sell to it, if not true retail, at least a lesser threshold than professional investors or qualified purchasers within the U.S. Perfect. Thank you, Lindsay. And maybe Liam, I can come to you just for a final thought on um, new investors and how they might inform a kind of new fund structure environment for the future. Yeah, I, I think Lindsay has captured it all pretty well, very well there. Um, but like we're, we're seeing the, the the usual investor the investor bases you know whether it's individuals high net worth institutional you know coming in to the the irrespective of fund structure we're probably not seeing too many differences there to be honest okay perfect i think we'll wrap it up there thank you liam thank you Lindsay, for your time it's been a great conversation um thank you the audience for listening in the next private funds industry live event in this series will take place on tuesday the 10th of january the theme will be expanding private funds in global markets and um, thank you everyone for listening. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.